At Kroger, we believe fresh means holding all our produce to a higher standard. To make sure a bad apple won't spoil the whole bunch, we do up to a 27-point inspection on our fruits and veggies. We check for things like sunburns and scarring, making sure you only get the crunchiest apples. In fact, only the best produce like juicy pears, zesty oranges, and crisp carrots reach our shelves. Because when it comes to fresh for everyone, we want our fruits and veggies to be the apple of your eye. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Welcome to The Vault Podcast. Classic music reviews. Presented by IV Creative. Now, here's your hosts, B. Cox and the crew. Greetings and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of the Vault Podcast, Classic Music Reviews. Presented by IV Creative, it's a perspective of the classics from a fresh point of view. We appreciate you for taking your time and lending your ears to our perspective. You could be anywhere listening to anything, but you're right here with us, so we thank you. With you today is yours truly, B. Cox, and with me, I have a member of the crew in the house with me here today, and I wanted to make sure we had him back on here. It's none other than my boy, J.O., here in the place to be. Jay, always good to have you back on here, man. The crew, we haven't been together as much as usual this year. There's been a lot of stuff going on, but I'm always welcoming the crew to come on here with me. And I wanted to make sure I had you on this week, man. So thanks for coming back on. Looking forward to having this conversation with you about this album we're going to do today. Because I know that we both have unique perspectives on this, considering where we were when this came out. But... We're going to get to that in just a second. Before we get to that, we want to, of course, thank all the listeners out there stateside and worldwide. Guys, for continuing to run those numbers up and continuing to spread the word. Thank you so much for doing that. We want to thank you all for connecting with us on social media. The action on our YouTube channel has been crazy out there. Guys, continue to support the show. Of course, make sure that you're visiting us on vaultclassicpod.com. That's vaultclassicpod.com. Check out the episodes. All the links to all the social media pages are there. Get to the YouTube channel. Leave us comments. Leave comments on reviews. Leave a voice note. And of course, the Buy Me a Coffee page. That's vaultclassicpod.com. As we always say here on The Vault, our motto is hashtag open the vault, hashtag nothing but the classics and MBTC. And Jay, this is something I wanted to make sure that when we were getting ready to do this album, I, I wanted to reach out to a couple of people. And first of all, shout out to my people at the Regular Level Podcast, Khalil and Agar, because normally on an album like this, I would reach out to them considering this reggae album we're about to cover. But things have been crazy. I haven't been able to reach out to them. They're in their 10th season. It will be 10th and final season of Regular Level Podcast. Make sure y'all go in and check them out, by the way. And I do have a couple of more coming up. Hopefully, we'll be able to get them on. But if I couldn't get them, I wanted to make sure that I reached out to Jay. And the reason why I wanted to reach out to Jay, because one, it's a reggae album. And two, it's a reggae album during a period when both of us, one, were in the same place. And then two, we know the impact that it had as far as where it was when we were of that time frame. And in pop culture, the type of impact. Why? Because we were both outside during that time. So (laughs) that's the reason why I wanted to reach out to Jay to have him on for this review. So we're going to go back 20 years ago. And we're going to go back to November 12th, 2002, to the second studio album of none other than dance hall superstar Sean Paul, Dutty Rock, released on VP and Atlantic Records with a runtime of 74 minutes and 50 seconds. Producers on this, lots of producers. There are the Neptunes produced on this, Mark Ronson. There are actually a lot of great reggae producers that were on here. The famed duo Steely and Cleavy by King Jammies, Deli Ranks, Sly Dunbar, Tony Kelly, Richie D. Martin, Flabba Malcolm. All these folks all produced out tracks on this album. So lots of great dance hall and reggae producers and also industry producers. And one of the producers on here by default as a re-releasing of this album happened the next year after it came out. Also Scott Storch, one of the biggest hits on this album. So lots of great producers on here. Really an all-star cast of producers on this a reggae album that would have such a great impact. The singles on here, there were tons and tons of singles. The first one was Give Me a Light which was released in 2002. Now, the what I'm leading, looking at, the source material says 2001, but I know for a fact that Give Me the Light was released in 2002. Why? Because I was outside during that time. That's why. <laughs> we know. Right. Get Busy was released We in the end of 2002, beginning of 2003. Light Glue was released not too long right after that, and I'm th- looking at this, Jay, and it's like the, the time period, like in between Get Busy and Light Glue, 
it sort of like runs like almost simultaneously for me because I feel like there was almost like at the same time, you know, that they were sort of out out at the same time. Right. Baby Boy, which was a monster hit with Beyonce, came out in the summer of 2003 in August. And then I'm Still in Love with You, which dropped late in, in October and then continued in and continued to be a great smash hit in 2004, which was a huge, huge hit again for a dance hall song. So lots of lots of great singles and all those singles I mentioned, by the way, Jay, you know, were all smashes. You know, so. these are all smashes. These aren't all like, oh, yeah, I remember that song. I remember that song vaguely like, no. Every single one of these songs that I just named from Dutty Rock were all singles that were smashes. They were smashes on the dance hall charts, but then we're talking about crossover appeal on all of these singles, which we'll get to in just a second. They were smashes. So, Dutty Rock, Jay, this was our time. This was those college years at Morgan State. These were those years when we had those parties, and at this time when we first got to Morgan, around the time when you first got there, right around 99, 2000, when I first got there, 2000, 2001, where you had that first wave of reggae, where you had that Beanie Man Art and Life album come out, that first Sean Paul album, Stage One, come out. You had like that effect sort of coming off of like that belly effect with that Deport Dem, and here comes the boom, boom, and then Beanie Man with Who Am I, and then all of a sudden Girls Dem Sugar with the Neptunes remix with Maya. Dance Hall becomes big. It becomes huge. It starts to become big. We move into the area right when Dutty Rock comes out, and you could tell like an explosion was just waiting to happen. Right around this time, we're sitting there, we're at these parties at Morgan, and we're noticing that these reggae sets at these parties are becoming more and more detailed. Then you start going to the actual reggae-specific parties at places like, damn, Hole in the Wall 4229, and places Mm -hmm. like that, Blue Caribbean, Blue Caribbean, where you go, and these joints are all over these parties, and it's just like, it didn't, it wasn't just like a niche thing for the Caribbean folks that were out there. It was starting to become like, yeah, mainstream folks are starting to party to this because this music has appeal, you know? And so... When this album came on the scene right around fall of 2002, reggae was begging for an explosion. And it seems while stage one was a really big hit, it seemed as though that Sean had a lot more to offer the game afterwards, man. So having this be sort of like the soundtrack to what the party scene was like in college was cool. But then when you knew that this was coming, when you got that first single drop, then it was just like, man, like you knew something big was coming after that. Now we'll go ahead and get right into it. First thoughts and reflections. So I'll go ahead and start with you, Jay. Your first thoughts on when you heard Dutty Rock and the album. And then, well, first of all, we'll start with just the lead up with the singles before the album came out. And then, of course, when you got the album and listened to the album, what you thought about it at first and what you continue to think about it now in the 20 years since it's um, been out and the legacy that it has. Yeah, for sure. So, like, you know what I'm saying? Sean Paul, dope. But I ain't gonna lie, like, when I first heard him, like, Honestly, I think I, I, I kind of thought he like his voice sounded like that of Super Cat. Yeah, well, yeah, I think that was the thing that a lot of people thought is that he he was sort of like a sort of like a a, a mini a little bit of a mini of a Super Cat clone because of his voice. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah, yeah, because like I mean, the first the, listen to Sean Paul, I mean, it's like really it's like going back to high school. Um, his joint on that Reggae Gold '98 soundtrack, not mm-hmm. soundtrack but compilation. Yeah. Fast forward a little bit past that, Dirty Rock came out. Of course, like the joint "Give Me the Light" was everywhere. Mm-hmm. Like us, black community, Caribbean community, we knew how big the, like the hit was. Yeah, but like, it, it makes me think back to one time at um Hammerjacks. I don't know if you ever got to go to Hammerjacks. Like, we, why oh were yeah, you Morgan. Oh, you did go? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Okay. Cool. Yeah. I mean, some people missed out on that. Like, yeah, I know. That was the first time I like martini. So that was like a really good night for me. So, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but nah, like you know, what I'm saying because like this was this one we were going to you know, it's like a lot of, you know what I'm saying, white folks in there, like thousand students, all like mm-hmm. that. Yeah. And that's like, and the joint came on as we were up, and like, big white bouncer dude, whatever, like, just starts flipping out. Like, he wants to party. He's like, dude, I love this fucking song. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sitting like, oh, shit. Like, that's how I knew that joint, like, you know what I'm saying, was transcending. Mm-hmm. With that, do you remember, like, the Black Chinese joints that was coming out back then? Yeah. Yeah. I remember that joint. Yeah. So, uh-huh. like, Black Chinese number seven, like they was playing this beat, and like, you know what I'm saying? I guess he had his dub play for like the Black Chinese joints. So it was like blowing up. There was some 
dance hall, like, you know what I'm saying? Like for that mix, that mixtape circuit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it was just like flowing along with that beat and everything like that. And then follow up of like, you know what I'm saying? Like I'm still in love with you and like get busy and everything like that. So mm-hmm. that Jane Duff had like slaps all over it. Like, you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Plus, like, he was kind of like, I'm saying, like, a ladies' man and everything like that. So, like, okay, like, these James flow. He had that persona. Like, it's going to be a smash. Yeah. So, like, fast forward to now, still holds up. A part of his legacy. So, you know what I'm saying? Like, it was like, I just thought it was like a solid project. Yeah. Yeah, nah, definitely. For me, my first reaction, heading into with me, I always kind of look, my period in the look back period with this kind of me always starts with, Because my cycle with Caribbean music always centered around DC Carnival. You know what Mm -hmm. I mean? And I know you can sort of, being from the area, you kind of can relate a little bit to that. But You took me back to Crossroads when I was working there, man. Like like the prep food was off the chain. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, nah. So my, my reference for Caribbean music and the cycle each year always centered around DC Carnival. If you got within about a month or so, you started looking in to figure out what the new music was coming out. You started looking to see where the new reggae and soca gold was coming out, what the new hot stuff was. If not, then you were looking for, yo, where are the dub plates, where are the mixtapes and everything, the soca mixes, the reggae mixes to find out what the new shit is going to be. Cause if, you were going to go out or whatever later on that night. You wanted to be up on what the new songs were. Absolutely. And like, and like why you could go out and, you know, you were hearing stuff in the club and the Internet sort of had things out. It was nowhere near to where it is now where you could get a song drop and it's on Twitter and on Facebook and on Instagram and everybody knows about it. And it goes to their provider of choice to go find it. You still kind of had to go to the mixtapes had to find out where the dub plates were, follow the DJs to find out what the music was. And if you weren't either in places like New York or if you weren't in Jamaica, then you weren't necessarily knowing where the songs were at and it wasn't getting here to America until it had been out maybe for like a year or so. So when Give Me The Light comes out right around, I would say summer 2002, in that DC Carnival season, it like really just that sparked a flame. Because then it was just like that rhythm. And you know that rhythm is a crazy ass rhythm, that buzz rhythm, you know what I'm saying? Which so many people got busy over, which brings me back to that era where there was rhythm and there would be five, six, seven artists that would get busy over that rhythm and would kill it. And he was the first one really that killed that buzz rhythm, which made it famous. That's the one at least that most of the public heard. And the streets go crazy off to that. The club goes crazy over that. And then you start to get into the rest of the other singles. Then you start to get into the other rhythms that are also on the singles. Get busy with that Diwali rhythm. And we knew Mm -hmm. that Diwali rhythm, I mean, it became so big that it stretched from that summer of 2002 all the way into the summer of 2003. And so many people hopped on that. And it became such a big hit commercially. And a lot of it all started because, again, Sean was the first person that a lot of people heard on that would get busy. And then with like glue with the buyout rhythm, like I said, get busy and like glue to me are always kind of tied to the hip because to me, those are two singles that sort of followed each other and they can like, can't be separated from me. They were like sort of like one following the other. You got to talk about get busy and like glue to me in the same sentence. These songs made the club go crazy. Mm-hmm. And while there were a lot of dance hall purists who were out there that were saying sort of the same thing, like you were saying, Jay, they were probably like, Oh, You know, well, Sean is, oh, he's this light-skinned boy. You know, they don't really think he was hard. They thought he was soft or, you know, trying to be a a super cat clone, everything else like that. But what he had was a formula. He had the voice. He had the look. And not only that, he had some lyrics. I mean, he could toast with the best of them. I mean, everyone wants to say whatever it is they want to say about Sean. But when you do hear him, he definitely, like, just like almost in the same vein, almost like a super cat does, can toast and can go with the best of them. And so it's just like, yo, he had all of the right formula come together. So when you're looking with somebody that has some crossover appeal that is going to make reggae pop, this had all of it. Then you throw into it like singles like Baby Boy with someone like Beyonce that was already, that was a big star already with Destiny's Child, but was becoming a big star, getting ready to release her debut solo album, who was on the way to superstardom. And you pair the two of them together out of this world, right? Like, I mean, now here we are 20 something years later, 
She's one of the top two or three biggest music stars in the game. And when you talk about reggae stars of the last two decades, he's unquestionably the biggest reggae star commercially. You know, I mean, obviously some people will definitely argue cartel. And if you want to talk about dancehall purists, probably say cartel is probably the biggest one. But Sean's global success is unmatched by no one. By no one. And 20 years ago, when they were just really starting to blow up, they did a song to his song with each other. And then I'm still in love with you, man, to this day, <laughs> which is a remake, by the way, that I'm still in love with you is a song that was um that was a remake that was done by originally by Alton Ellis and then was later done by Marsha Aitken. So this is like the third iteration of this song that was done, a reggae song that was done. And it was brilliantly done with Sean Paul and Sasha. The video made it sort of like to the point where that song went to a whole nother level as well, because it just gave you sort of like that feeling. And then when Sean talked about what he wanted to accomplish with the album, he said he wanted it to make us that Jamaicans would like. And he said he wanted to take it back to like the parties that people would have in their backyards in Jamaica the feeling that it got when you got on the dance floor and you got your first wine from a girl or something like that. He said, that's what the feeling he wanted to recapture with that. So you had the singles, but then you had the album tracks on here that were on here that kicked as well. I mean, being able to have a track with someone like Rozelle and then also having a track with someone like Cecile, <laughs> you know, <laughs> then do a remix of give me the light with, with Buster Rhymes, which would then turn around and then Sean will return the favor with Buster on Make It oh, Clap, clap right. you know? So it really then started this period of like two or three years where there were lots of rappers and reggae artists collaborating with each other, R&B singers collaborating with each other. You saw Baby Sham doing something with Alicia Keys. You saw Mims doing something with Junior Reed and Baby Sham, you know? So it was lots of collaboration happening and it would become reggae because reggae was becoming so big because of this album. Like... The streets, I was be, you really, when I'm saying you had to be outside, you really had to be outside to understand. Like this, <laughs> try to tell them I'm not exaggerating this, Jay. I'm not, you know, not you, at all. you had to be outside to understand like how big this album was considering that reggae was on the fringes of the mainstream and it really burst into the mainstream big time where people who didn't fuck with reggae at all, all of a sudden was like, Oh shit, I like this. Let me find more what it is that I like. Let me, who else can I listen to about? And then all of a sudden people who like Sean Paul are then going in to find Mr. Vegas, find their ways into more Beanie Man, find a more bounty killer, eventually into more Movado and Vibes <laughs> Cartel and Tony Mataron. So it's right. like, and I always did, I always did love that they, um, Paul and Mr. Vegas like working together. Like yeah, they just, you know what I'm saying. It was always like clash so like worked so well together. Yeah, nah, they did. They had a good working relationship, man, for a long while. Even going back to stage one with Hot Gal today, you know what I'm saying? It, it was mm -hmm. um off that street sweeper. Yeah, truck. exactly. Yeah, man, so that's my shit. Yes, yes, yes. So <laughs> definitely something that man. This album did a lot for the the club. It did a lot for um, for reggae fans. Some people who necessarily who are purists may not necessarily liked it, but it, even if you're a purist, for those of you who love the 90s and may have even loved 80s dance hall and reggae and love 90s dance hall and reggae, you can't deny the fact that it's how this album was as big as it was, man. It definitely kicked down some doors because it went just not just into the American market. This went into Europe, you know, <laughs> this went hugely into Europe, into Asia and into Africa. This may have actually, you know, started to have been maybe even a catalyst that led into what Afro beats and Afro pop being to what it is right now, you know, because then without this, you're not going to be able to get the stuff that Movado and, and cartel gave you that eventually became probably the inspiration that Afro pops and Afro beats, the sound that you hear right now. So yeah, it definitely was a time period and something, a moment that couldn't really be captured unless you were right there. I mean, you really couldn't imagine how big it was. Highlights and lowlights. So, Jay, let's run down your highlights and any lowlights if you have them from uh, from Dutty Rock. Of course, the singles like Give Me the Light, Light Glue, Get Busy, the Give Me the Light Remix. I would say Joke and Pony, like, mm -hmm. them was on there. My Name, which kind of surprised me, was on there because I know that journey came out like maybe two years earlier. Mm hmm. That I'm off that I'm Scarface rhythm. Yeah, yeah, the Scarface I rhythm. Because yeah. like when I first got to Morgan, I was I remember I had like that compilation CD. Mm-hmm. 
getting on in. Sean Paul sure enough was on in. I was like, wait a minute, I heard this before. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if it was filler, but I mean, it's still, it's still slap. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, of course. Like, you know, can you do the work? And um, I mean, just cause, like, I was, because I wasn't expecting that comp, that combination with Rozelle. Mm-hmm. Yes. Like, man, he just, yeah. Such, in my opinion, it's kind of a whole beatboxing thing, man. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, low lights, giving it like my top three as far as producers that made the chain, but I could have done without Bubble. Mm, okay. I mean, I guess like it's kind of like listen to during that, like you making beats. It's like, mm-hmm. it's kind of, I, I think I'm not to remind it's like, don't overthink shit. Yeah. So for that dream to make the album, yeah. Maybe it was just like the name of the Neptunes because the Neptunes were like hot. Yeah. But you know what I'm saying? I definitely wouldn't say it was one of their best beats. I, I mean, I definitely could have done without that one. Yeah, of course. I don't know if I, I know Baby Boy was on a release, or on the re release rather. So I don't know if I count as far as like the original release, but mm-hmm. it's one of the re-release. Another highlight just, just made me think about that. Yeah. Oh, I was gonna say one more. Um, as far as like the Dudley Wright intro, like, you know, what I'm saying like the little faux rock and roll versions, of like his past. Mm-hmm. Just like how I mean, it sounded cool. It sounded like something that could be dope as far as like a live performance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I kind of like those renditions of it, but uh, be it for me. Yeah, true. <sighs> okay, true. So my highlights, obviously, all the singles. Um, I mentioned, of course, give me the light. Um, get busy and light glue. I mean, all these joints were club smashes. I'm still in love with you. Um, like I said, it's crazy. Um, I, I felt like the I feel like the video for all of these kind of like helped bring these songs to another level too. You know what I'm saying? Like I felt like especially the I'm still in love with you video was something that I believe when we talk about vid- classic videos. I feel like that video was definitely in the pantheon of classic videos. I mean the whole, the whole vibe, yeah, man. the whole dance scene and stuff with the dances and stuff on the and everything, just like the club scene and everything. Like yo, it's. It's definitely a vibe. It definitely was a vibe. When we took it into the non-singles, though, definitely agree with you on top of the game with Rozell. Rozell definitely was spitting some bars in there in the beginning, and obviously the sound effects and the beatboxing and everything. I mean, he's the king of that, honestly. Can you do the work with Cecile? That little back and forth between her and Sean, I thought that played well. And then, you know, that liquid rhythm, I mean, uh, that mm-hmm. had become a big hit earlier that year with Tonto Metro and Devonchi with Give It To Her. I mean, so we have been used to hearing that rhythm, and that rhythm was a huge, huge hit. Then I did, like, of course, My Name, and that had been out for a couple of years. Cause I remember hearing that on some on some sort of mixtape. I'm not sure exactly where it was, but I had heard it prior to that year. And so I was like, okay, but this it definitely does still slap. I do like Shake That Thing, too. I mean, again, it's, it's one of those things, another that pops, and it goes into the club. Another rhythm, that surprise rhythm, that definitely another joint that goes. You've heard artists all go over that as well. Mm-hmm. Another one that you know, he was one of the first people that you heard over that. But then there were other artists that also went over that rhythm, that surprise rhythm too. Capleton is the one that I'm thinking about off the top of my head. And then, you know, even songs like Punky and, and Joke and Pony, you know, are, are songs that I think are cool too. I, as far as low lights are concerned, like you said, I think Bubble is one that I think I could kind of throw out. I mean, give me the light. I also like that as a highlight because, I mean, obviously, but anything Buster was doing during that time, he was sort of hot during that time as well. And the whole cross collaboration he had with Sean, where, you know, obviously Buster being Jamaican, knew lots of reggae artists down there, and he obviously can make that easy transition. And then how they sort of cl- collaborated again the following year on Make It Clap, it only made sense. Low lights, I mean, bubble. Yeah, I mean, I could sort of do without it. The whole thing, like, you know, the the punky Espanol, though I know Tego Calderon was on that, and they did that and put that on there because they wanted to appeal to an international audience, hence the reason why they also did the re-release for Baby Boy. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I was uh, kind of okay with Ganja Breed at first, but now listening to it, I'm just like, mm, I don't know. I, I, I will not say necessarily this is a low light, but if it wasn't on there, I wouldn't feel bad about it. I mean, it's just like, mm. It's okay. <laughs> it is all right. It is okay. Um, but not many low lights though. I mean, there's not many much stuff on here that if I'm if I'm playing that I'll skip. So if, I was if, gonna say it's, I was gonna say it's also educational too. Get busy video because like because mm-hmm. I, I did like you know what I'm saying that basement party thing. But of yes. course, main lesson I learned from that video was do not bang on the man's. Yes, stop banging on the damn ceiling. (laughs) (laughs) And then when he and then when they kept doing it, what did he tell him? Get out! You know what I'm saying? Party done. (laughs) (laughs) So if you drink at a place of party, yeah, don't bang on the furnace. Don't bang on the furnace. Exactly. Yeah, man. It's like yo, stop doing it. You know what I'm saying? 
But it's um that was that was another thing. Yes, yes, that get busy video. And that thing pretty much led and led right into with them doing the video to light glue. So that's the reason why I think also as well, I put the two of them together because get busy and light glue kind of like just, you know, go together with me. And that's but yeah. But not really much low lights. I, I think to me, I can let this play through and not much not much skip anything. And it does give me a lot of great memories during that time because this was a soundtrack, man. It this was you know, like you said, I'm thinking about days, 4229, Blue Caribbean, Crossroads, you know, <laughs> so many sports different hall. sports hall, like so many different other places I went where they would play reggae music. And this was the soundtrack to so much of it. This, to me, helped to carry through an era that I'll speak on in just a second when we're going into the last segment. And so why I think this is so important. It serves as a soundtrack, though, man, that was really, really good. Uh, time for really for if you were partying during that time and you loved you did like to have a good time and dance this really was a great soundtrack towards that time final verdict so jay what say you about dutty rock and your final verdict is it classic album is it a uh, central album is it just dope or is it good or is it nah, not really something to write home about uh, definitely not going to choose. i'm gonna have to say classic okay i guess nine i'd say Okay, nine out of ten. Yeah, because I mean, because I, I had to take off point for that bubble joint. So okay, true. <laughs> that, I mean, I, it, this is factory joint out, man. Like yeah, and it's like in the, and it's like oh two. This like in the middle of when they they was on like fire. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, exactly. They were they were Neptunes. Yeah, everything they were touching was gold, and they were killing everything. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And uh, across many different genres, they were producing for people. They were t- they were killing everything. So yeah, you're right. I'm gonna have to say definitely classic as well. And said that nine out of 10, I think that this album, when it came to reggae, did so many things in regards to keeping the genre on a commercial side as far as success was concerned and visibility. Like there are probably many dance hall albums that are better than this at this. I mean, quality wise, I mean, there are probably many dance hall albums that are better than this. But I think when it comes to visibility and the success commercially, there aren't many that stand up toe to toe with this one. It, what it's done as far as the radio was getting be able to get the radio play for reggae music, being able to push certain songs on the radio where the American public and the international public are open to them. I mean, shoot, look at how many people now push so many reggae influence tracks now. Like Tory Lanez doing a remix that everybody falls in love and Drake with controller and one dance and like all these th- like it's crazy. Like now you can hear stuff like, you know, Hood Celebrity with walking trophies. And, you know, you heard songs like, you know, songs from Cartel and Tony Matron. Dutty Wine was a big song that people would play during uh, mixes. That was a big part of helping to push reggae visibility wise. Honestly, Jay, this is a period in 2002 that started like I would say a good almost year and a half to two year period where reggae music like that, these rhythms we're talking about, the buyout, the liquid rhythm, the buzz rhythm, the Wally rhythm, where reggae really got, really got busy. We're talking specifically even the next summer, the summer of 2003, where I officially named that my reggae summer. You know what I'm saying? Because of how many people were so big during that summer. By the following summer, you had hit singles by Wayne Wonder, by Elephant Man, by T.O.K., by Sean Paul. All these different people that I'm naming out there, just these people that had hit singles, you know, that were all like immensely popular in the public consciousness. And I felt like this album helped to start that period. Like started like in the fall of 02 that continued probably all the way up until like Nina Sky in 2004, where they were still using the rhythm with uh, Move Your Body, where it became huge, you know, where not just, I would say, reggae music, but then Caribbean music overall, I think, got a bigger view in the consciousness of the American and international public where it became immensely popular and people started to give it some notice. So that's the reason why it's a classic. And Sean only started to become even bigger from there. After this, when he released Trinity, by the time Trinity came around, he was a certified global superstar. What we'd be burning in temperature, and he became just even a bigger pop star afterwards. And now almost 20-something years later, I mean, he's in another stratosphere in regards to superstardom. You know what I'm saying? He's everywhere now, and he's working with artists all over the globe and so many different genres. So, And this is pretty much where a lot of it all started when he first became a superstar. Sean Paul, 
Dusty Rock, 20 years old. Make sure y'all go check it out, man. Lots of great singles on here. Lots of great party music. I mean, there's singles and songs on here that I still hear DJs playing now when they're out just randomly mixing. So when you got songs that can stand up, dance songs that can stand up 20 years afterwards in a genre that's not considered to be mainstream still, you know you got a hit on your hand. So make sure y'all go definitely check that out. So what do y'all think? Hit us up on social media. Hit us up, of course, vaultclassicpod.com. Get to us on the conversation. What do y'all think about Dirty Rock? If y'all were around and outside during that time, what were your favorite tracks? What are your favorite memories from hearing songs from this album? Hit us up with the conversation. We'd love to continue it. And that is going to wrap up yet another edition of The Vault. Please make sure you are visiting us at vaultclassicpod.com. That's vaultclassicpod.com. There you can learn more about the show. Check out our past episodes. Join our mailing list. Leave a review. Or if so inclined, you can leave us a voice note. Click the blue microphone in the bottom right hand corner to leave us a voice note to let us know what you think about the show or to just show us some love. To support the show, click the coffee cup shaded in yellow in the bottom left hand corner to access our Buy Me A Coffee page. On Buy Me A Coffee, you can give a small monetary donation to support the show to ensure that we can keep the vault open for many years to come. You can also visit us on social media at Vault Classic Pod on IG, Twitter and on TikTok. Also hit us on YouTube and our Facebook page. Like and follow us on social media. Subscribe to the pod and the YouTube channel. We do it here all for you. We appreciate the support. And if you have a friend, tell a friend and make sure that that friend tells a friend. Always remember to keep your headphones on and your music loud, but not too loud. And as we close, we'd like to remind everyone to dream big because dreams are the basis for creation. Always create, motivate and elevate. Because you were never destined or created to stay stationary or ordinary in this life. And on that note, we say peace. Thank you for listening and coming into The Vault. Please subscribe and visit us at vaultclassicpod.com. That's vaultclassicpod.com.